right. So uh, this week I'm going to be talking about thinking like a macroeconomist. One second. I realize the music's too loud. By the way, I hope you're appreciating how I've upped my YouTube game here with the uh, generic music in the background and uh, the uh, video in the upper right-hand corner. In any case, uh, let's jump into it. So what kind of thinking do we do every day? I mean, the kind of thinking we do about the economy, we have a certain amount of money. How do you want to spend it? Maybe you have a student job. Should you go to the coffee shop? Should you buy a Starbucks coffee? Should you save it, make some coffee at home? You also have it so you have a budget in terms of money. You also have a budget in terms of time. You've got a limited amount of time in the day. Should you, how, how do you want to use that time? Do you want to sleep a little bit more? Do you want to work a little bit more? Get a little bit more money? This is the sort of thinking you have in microeconomics. All right, so I'll call that microeconomic thinking. So with macroeconomic thinking, what I mean by that is not thinking about money or an individual's budget constraint or a firm's profit maximization, but rather thinking about questions like overall in society, what's produced? You know, how much stuff is made and what is made? Also, just thinking about of the stuff that's made, how do we divvy that stuff up? Who gets what? Right? So those sort of resource type questions are what I'll call macroeconomic thinking. So I'll just write that here just so I can start writing something. Resources. This is about resources. How much do we have total to split up? Yeah. Hmm. yeah, so this whole question kind of starts with money. So I think thinking about money makes everything confusing. And in fact, for the whole first part of this course, we're hardly going to talk about money at all. So that immediate question is, how come the government can't make everybody richer just by printing money and handing it out? I mean, you know, we could all become millionaires if only the government would print more money and give it to us. Okay, so, as you well know, the reason why we, that's not going to work is because, let's see what I have on the next slide here. <clears throat> you know, money is what we think about in our everyday lives. But what really matters ultimately is not money itself, but what money can buy. If you like, what matters is consumption. Or, um, or maybe more generally, because it might not only be things that we consume that we want, more generally welfare. Okay, so that'd be things like, I'm gonna change this to a different color, I think, to make it a little bit, stand off a little bit more. How does that work? Let's try blue. So, you know, things like leisure time might matter for us as well as how much we consume. Um, but the point is, it's not money that we care about. It's the things that money can buy. So if the government just prints out a bunch of money, you know, that doesn't make us richer because the prices have to respond. All right, so I think that one of the reasons why money makes everything confusing is because it simultaneously does three things. So money is a medium of exchange. So, um, you know, there's this, I'm sure you guys have all studied this in either micro or macroeconomics as undergraduates. So it's just a review, but you have this double coincidence of wants problem. Double coincidence of wants. So the issue is, I'm somebody, I mean, for my job, I do basically three things. I lecture, I teach in economics, I, uh, I also do research, and then I also do administrative tasks here at CBS. So the issue is, you know, those things are very disconnected from the type of things I want in my daily life. So for instance, if I go to the grocery store, and want to buy a, uh, a dozen eggs, then it's unlikely that just at that moment, the employee in the grocery store is going to want an economics lesson. 
Okay, so it's very rare that we actually meet somebody who wants exactly what we want or who wants exactly what we have and also who has exactly what we want. That's a very unusual situation. So money is going to help with that because, um, you know, I can sell my economics lectures to you uh, who at the moment purchased economics lectures, whether you want them or not. Um, and then later I can take the money that I made and give it to somebody who has what I need, exit the supermarket. Okay, so it's going to kind of solve that problem. And in fact, if you were to kind of make a list of all transactions, you know, David to you was an economics lecture, econ lecture, and then grocery store to David, eggs, and so on and so forth. And you know, maybe you sell something to someone at your campus job, etc. You know, if you were to kind of make this gigantic list of transactions, ultimately, if you're going to add up the value of everything that I purchased and compare it to the value of everything that I produced, then at least over my lifetime in a pure accounting sense, that's going to kind of equal out. Okay, so, so money is in a way, in its function as a medium of exchange, it's taking the place of this list of transactions. So there's a, a famous paper by a, uh, um, a Minnesota Fed economist named uh, Coach Lakota, which is called, I just realized that it, money is memory. You can learn more about that if you want, you can look it up. Of course, it's kind of a technical paper. All right. So anyway, that's the first role of money. The second role of money is literally an asset. Okay, so what is an asset? It's something that takes value in one day and moves it into a, another day. Okay, so for instance, if I'm a farmer and I produce a bunch of apples in the fall, you know, I won't produce anything in the spring. So, I don't want to eat all of my apples. I want to give my apples away to people and then in the spring, those people that I gave the apples to, they're going to give me something back, okay? So sort of that IOU, if I give you an apple today and then you give me an IOU, that IOU is an asset, all right? So money is a, is a type of asset because if I make money today, I can hold on to that money and then spend it tomorrow. So uh, it stores value. And there's not much more to say about that function than what I just said. Finally, money uh, acts as a unit of account. And this is actually a really important one. So, um, you know, if you think about something like thinking about how much is produced in an entire economy, right? You know, in an entire economy, we have apples and we have cars and what, else? you know, we have, that's an awesome car picture. We have, um, you know, hot dogs. This is a France hot dog, Danish specialty. Um, and all sorts of stuff, right? I, I don't know why, but I'm thinking about food. We've got eggs, we've got new homes that are produced. We've got services, we've got haircuts. We've got all sorts of things, restaurant meals, um, massages, lectures, whatever. Anything you can think of that's produced in the economy, uh, if we wanna sort of compare them and add them up and then think about a number like GDP, gross domestic product, then we have to put them into some single unit. So I mean, we could try to translate everything into apples. Why not? You know, why not say, uh, how many apples would it take to buy a car? How many apples would it take to buy a France hot dog? How many apples would it take to buy an egg, et cetera, et cetera? You know, add everything up in apples, and then you could measure GDP in apples. You could do that, but um, it's much more typical to measure GDP in units of currency. So um, basically, one important role of money is putting everything in a single 
everything in the same term so we can compare uh, prices and values of things across goods. Okay. So mostly I would say for the first half of this course until we get to monetary policy, really these two functions of money are not going to be important for us. The one that's going to be important is just this one. Sometimes we're going to measure the value of goods and money. So that's it. So to give you an example of why money th makes things confusing, in my opinion, let's think about saving. Okay. So here's the micro way to think about saving. So a consumer might invest some money in an asset. So you might invest you know, a thousand kroner in the stock market. Of course, you're gonna, when you're thinking about that investment, you have to choose among a bunch of different instruments. You could invest in the stock market. You could invest in a bond. You could. Just leave the money in your bank. You could put it under your. You could withdraw the cash from the bank. Put it under your pillow. You could loan it to your friend. There's many things you can do to to save your money. All right. So when you're doing that, of course, you're going to want to compare your rate of return in these different instruments versus inflation. So we expect that money tomorrow is worth a little bit less than money today. So you have to kind of deflate your investment by inflation. And then also you want to compare risk and reward. You know, if I leave the money under my pillow, it's unlikely that anything's going to happen to it. But if I give it to my friend, it might be that they don't pay, pay me back tomorrow. So, I mean, you have to compare sort of how much you get back, the interest rate you'll get back versus the risk that's involved when you uh, make the investment. Right. You could also say purchase property. That's another type of investment. All right. Um, and, the, and at the end of the day, you're going to want to kind of choose among this big variety of investments, the asset that can be sold for the most tomorrow. Okay, of course, adjusted for risk. All right, so um, you can see that this is kind of a confusing way of thinking about saving. I mean, there's all sorts of different people you could be lending your money to, et cetera, et cetera. So rather, let's think about saving from a macro perspective. So what does saving mean in terms of resources? So first, let's think about consumption and production. Okay, so some goods are produced today and also consumed today. So if you think about this word consumption, it literally means to use up. So when you consume something, no one else can use that again. That's kind of the idea. So for instance, if you eat an apple, no one else can eat that apple. If you, uh, if you, go watch a play, then, you know, that play is over, it's done. That was maybe not the best example, but you get what I mean. So to consume means to use up. Investment in a macroeconomic sense, in a resource sense, it means we're going to produce something, we're not going to consume it today. If we're not going to consume it, why would we produce it? We're going to produce it because it's going to increase production tomorrow. So what would be an example of this? So an example might be, we're going to make a machine. Okay. We're going to build a new factory. So, um, you know, those things, they're not, we're, we're not going to consume them. They're going to make us more productive tomorrow. Great example of an investment or saving in a macroeconomic sense is that right now you're going to Copenhagen business school. So what does that mean? It means that you yourself are going to have more human capital in the future. Your wages are going to be higher in the future. You will be more productive. Okay, so this is sort of macroeconomic saving. And what I want you to notice here, there is no money involved. I mean, of course, in these transactions, in the actual transactions that are taken to make this stuff happen, sure, people are trading money, but in the sense of producing things and consumption, you can see in, in, in this uh, story I've been telling here, uh, money was not necessary. Okay, so um, let's think about production at its, at its most basic level, what we mean by production. Okay. So what do we do when we produce? Well, we take the world as it is. There's a certain amount of resources in the world and we're gonna do something to that to the world, we're going to change something to make it more valuable. So, you know, you might take 
a tree and you might chop it down and turn it into toothpicks. So a tree is valuable by itself, of course, it's very nice to look at, but toothpicks arguably are more valuable because we can use them for something. Uh, production can also be extracting resources, you're just reading off the slide here, but um, adding labor to something, so a bicycle plus bicycle repair makes it a better bicycle, or combining different components, so a hamburger is equal to bread, ketchup, lettuce, onion, and meat patty, and the combination of those things together is worth more than each of those components by itself. Okay, so that's production, and notice that there's no money involved. We don't need to reference money to talk about what production is. Slight side note, because I'm gonna have a kahoot about it. What is rent seeking? <clears throat> so rent seeking involves seeking to increase one's share of existing wealth without creating new wealth. So it's sort of different than production. It's also something people do to get more resources, but it's not actually growing the size of the pie, if you will. So what would be one example of rent seeking? A uh, classic example would be uh, locking your door of your house. You know, that lock, nobody can really consume the lock. The lock is just protecting your stuff. Okay, so there's no sort of extra product production we get, extra value we get by locking the door. It's just keeping the stuff for ourselves. Okay, so that act of, of locking the door is a type of rent seeking. You know, more generally it would be something like trying to, um, you know, get politicians to sort of protect your industry would be sort of an economics example of rent seeking. So what's wrong with rent seeking? Well, that labor that you spend securing your stuff so that nobody steals it, you know, what we do to prevent people from stealing things, you know, you could even say paying the police force. Um, in a sense, it's wasting valuable resources because that labor could be spent in order to produce things that we actually could use, that we could consume, uh, or alternatively, we could just free up more time if we didn't have to have a police department. Um, so that rent seeking itself is a waste of resources. I think I'm gonna pause the video here um, just so that I can um, upload smaller videos rather than one huge video. So let me just stop this recording.